Welcome to LSE IQ. I'm Jess Winterstein, and this is the podcast where we ask leading social scientists and other experts to answer an intelligent question. Bribery, extortion, cronyism, nepotism, influence peddling, embezzlement. Corruption comes in many forms and with varying levels of legality. According to the global NGO Transparency International, Illicit financial flows, including bribery, theft and tax evasion, cost developing countries more than 1.26 trillion US dollars per year. The EU Commissioner for Home Affairs has estimated that its member states alone lose 120 billion euros to corruption annually. Corruption might have the greatest impact on the world's poorest countries, but it is a universal problem that in some way or other touches us all. In this episode, I explore the question, is corruption inevitable? Right now, we know that the biggest disease of all is not a disease, it's corruption. But there's a vaccine for that too. It's called transparency, open data sets. This is a delicate thing to say to a group of leaders uh, in their House of Parliament, but uh, um, you, uh, you have to fight the cancer of corruption. Corruption destroys a country, it destroys state institutions, it destroys money, uh, the the human development, because money meant for human beings ends up in people's pockets. It causes money laundering, which puts pressure on your currency, which devalues, which means inflation. Uh, so, So I came to fight against corruption. A disease, a cancer, a destroyer of countries. From rock stars to world leaders, the general consensus is that corruption is disastrous, causing great damage to a nation's economic prosperity and its reputation. So why then, despite the regular pledges of governments around the world to combat it, does corruption still flourish? What we label corruption from our perspective, living in the Western world here, uh, is in many ways how we've always lived our lives. It's a more natural way of being. We just label it corruption from this kind of modern standpoint. That was Dr. Michael Muthukrishna, Assistant Professor of Economic Psychology at LSE. Michael's research explores a variety of related topics, including innovation, corruption, and the rise of large-scale cooperation. While one might consider corrupt behavior as a dishonest act carried out for personal profit or advantage, Michael takes the view that corruption is more the result of a biological drive that we all share. There's There's a big puzzle in evolutionary biology, and it's the puzzle of cooperation. So why is it that any organism um, would give up uh, its self-interest for the interest of a a larger group of individuals? So self-interest for the group. Um, And it's it's a difficult puzzle. It's a difficult problem to solve. In fact, it's so difficult that uh, Science Magazine in 2005 listed it as one of its 125 big questions for the the coming decades. So what I've done is to um, is to take all of this, this work that's been done on cooperation, this framework for understanding how it is that organisms, humans included, work with one another, uh, and applied it to this puzzle of, of corruption that exists in the, in the political and economic sphere. Michael argues that although corruption might appear to be a breakdown in cooperation, in fact, corruption is cooperation. I asked him to explain. The kind of smallest scale of cooperation above an individual is groups of families, groups of related individuals working with one another, right? Um, and and we, have, we have a framework for understanding. It's called inclusive fitness or, or kin selection. Um, and it's kind of the equals MC squared of evolutionary biology, that if the relatedness times the benefit is going to be greater than the cost to yourself, then genes that can identify and favor copies of themselves, according to this rule, will spread at the expense of those that don't. So you will be more likely to help your sister than you are to help your cousin, and more likely to help your cousin than to help a, a much more distant relative. So nepotism is just a natural way exactly, that we evolve. Exactly, exactly. So what we call, uh, you know, if, 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 a, if a president were to give a favor to his daughter, for example, um, we would call this nepotism. But actually, it's just inclusive fitness undermining our institutions. Um, and so you can do this for kind of every, every kind and every scale of, of cooperation. So you might not like your office mates, but you'll continue to work with them in this kind of quid quo pro, you scratch my back, you, uh, I scratch yours way, what we call direct reciprocity. So if you screw me over, I know who you are, and I can come get you, right? Uh, if you help me, likewise, I can help you in return. So that explains um, 
why we work with people, we regularly interact it. You can build that a little bit further if you build in reputation, what we call indirect reciprocity. So I might not know you directly, but if you screw me over, I'll tell other people about you. And similarly, if you help people, they'll tell people about you. And I can conditionally choose to work with you because I've heard good things or conditionally choose to avoid you because I've heard bad things. So if a, if a manager were to, instead of going through the normal human resource processes for a recruitment, were to give a friend a job or a friend of a friend, we call that cronyism. But actually, from the perspective of, let's say, biology, um, it's just direct or indirect reciprocity, again, undermining our meritocratic institutions. Where do you sort of place greed? Is financial gain uh, not necessarily the, the big driver that we might think? I mean, I, I think it's more that um, Self-interest is ever present, but it's not the it's not the cause of these things. It's just part of the framework. Humans, we're in competition with one another for status, for for money, for for resources, and so on. Right, um, but that's always true. Whether you're in a, uh, a a very corrupt place or whether you're in a, a place that's not very corrupt, the difference is what are the range of things that I'm allowed to do in order to get what I want for me and mine. Right? I mean, norms do play a part here. So there, there's work, for example, um, by Raj Chetty uh, that shows that um, one of the big predictors of whether you will engage in tax loopholes is not whether it's beneficial to you, right? That's always true. Like, it, it might always be beneficial to you, but it's whether your neighbors are doing it. So you discover that, A, you can get away with it, and B, how to do it. Right? If you don't have that information, uh, then you might never think to, to, to do that because you don't know what the probability is that you're going to get caught. So, so it's in, I, I think people have the tendency to go, you know, look at Wall Street, look at how greedy they are. But it's not the greed per se. Um, humans are humans. And, and let me link that to, a, to this other idea that uh, people often think about corruption as being kind of isolated at the, at the top end of society. Right? They, there's this feeling like, Look at our leaders. Look at look at what the prime minister has done. Look at what the president has done. Look at what these ministers have done. If only we could select the right people, then there would be no corruption anymore. But actually, from this perspective, those kinds of behaviors that we call corrupt are ever present throughout the society, right? So yes, it's the pre the prime minister who gives his his brother a uh, a position in parliament. But equally, uh, it's the it's the, it's the visa officer who gives his friend uh, a quicker pathway through the line so you can get your visa sorted out more quickly. Um, it's the shopkeeper who, uh, who gives his, uh, his, his niece uh, a job. You know, it's it, those kinds of behaviors, this tendency to favor your family and friends, these are kind of two big drivers, nepotism and cronyism, they're present throughout the society. So the question is, where do you draw the line? Jonathan Weigel, Assistant Professor of International Development at LSE, agrees that at the most basic level, corruption stems from one of our most basic instincts. I think that is, it's human nature to try to improve your lot. It's human nature to try to help out your kin. And these are deeply embedded in our, in our cultures, in our, maybe in our DNA. I think primatologists have, have studied this quite a bit. And you do find, for example, in Francis Fukuyama's uh, recent uh, books, he, he, he talks about sort of how deeply rooted um, sort of kin favoritism is. And um, so I think, I, think it's, I think it is fundamental. And there's a process of institutionalization. This is, again, Fukuyama's word, where societies try to create constraints on individual behavior to reduce those temptations to help your kin or to you know uh, take a little money on the side and the process that process of institutionalization sort of occurs over the course of history and as, as states develop and, and and build more capacity but there can also there's always it's always sort of a, a back and forth and there can be a, a process of institutional decay where these, these fundamental kind of, I think, very rational human responses to institutions to, you know, to, again, to try to better your lot and to try to help your kin will, will, will resurface because humans are creative and technologies change and institutions change. So I think it's always going to be a bit of a back and forth between the process of creating institutions to put constraints on behavior and this pretty hardwired desire to, to better your lot and favor your kin. Well, what's the danger for, for countries if they don't really start to tackle corruption? I would say that it means that the state will be deprived of resources. And there's another, 
almost more pernicious failure of governance, which is when um, agents in the center expect corruption uh, in the periphery or you know at a lower level of government, and so then they don't even try to implement some project because you just expect that the people further down the chain are just going to take all the money. And so you get kind of a failure of imagination or a failure of expectations. That's really pernicious because if, you know, that, that really is more about your perception in the center of what other people will be doing in the first place. Um, I, so I think, I think the biggest issues here are that the government then cannot step in to uh, do certain very needed uh, jobs that the government has to do. The, we, we need governments for certain key tasks, right? We need them to, um, you know, settle uh, disputes. We need governments to provide certain public goods, to reduce certain externalities. Um, you, you know, those, that's just the very minimum set of things that we expect governments to do. There, there's a, a larger uh, set of um, set, set of set of things that we think governments may want to do, but that sort of depends on uh, on your views. So I don't want to necessarily go there. Um, but uh, I think the the key thing here is that corruption it renders toothless the government in its quest to you know uh, actually provide some kind of adjudication of contracts and to pr and to provide public goods and to redress those externalities. Right. So it, every piece of what the government could and should be doing is then rendered less effective. Michael is also clear about the potential damage corruption can do to society. If you want your governments to work, if you want people to be voting uh, not for their, you know, their, their clan as a group, but voting for their own interests, um, if you want a democracy in that way, then you have to suppress these kind of, uh, these kind of tendencies. Now, it's a tricky thing, right? The, the devil's in the details. The places where you rely on your friends and family are also the places in which the state is weak. And so you can't rely on the government to help you. You have to rely on your friends and family. But that, in turn, undermines the, the potential of the government to, to, uh, to provide goods for its citizens. So it's this, it's this tricky and difficult balance between these, uh, between these two forces. In his paper, Corrupting Cooperation and How Anti-Corruption Strategies May Backfire, Michael and his co-authors use the public goods game to understand how the dynamics between cooperation and corruption might operate. I asked him to explain. Often it's nice to kind of take the, the world and all of its complexity and have a stylized version of that, that that captures what we think is the essence of the dilemma that people face. And so this has been done using what's called a public goods game. So you can think about this as kind of taxes, something in which we all pay into and then we all benefit from equally. So clean air, clean water, the roads that, you know, in, in the UK at the NHS, for example. So we take a public goods game. Now the question is how do we sustain cooperation? What is a public goods game? Let me, let me go back for a second. Let's say there's 10 players. I'm going to give each of them 10 pounds. And then they can put whatever they want from 0 to 10 into a central pool. And I'm going to multiply that pool by some amount. And then I'm going to redistribute it to everybody equally. This is the key, equally. So if there's 10 people, and uh, let's say I'm going to multiply it by, by 3 then it's in everyone's best interest to put all of that money into that central pool. So if 10 people put 10 uh, into the pool uh, and, and I multiply that by three, now it's, it's 300, I divide it up, now you go home with 30. But the thing is that it's in your best interest to, to not put anything in there, to not pay any taxes, have everyone else pay the taxes to sustain this. And if you're alone in doing that, right, let's say you put zero in and everyone else puts 10 in, you're gonna get something closer to 40 pounds and everyone else is going to get you know less than 30. So what happens when you play this game with people is that initially they play at whatever the norm is in their society. So they'll, you know maybe gave 50% of whatever they have, right? But as they as they play it over and over again, they realize that just by putting a little bit less they can be better off and eventually people are putting effectively nothing. So the puzzle is what can we introduce into this stylized version of the world to sustain people's contributions? All kinds of things have been, have, so people use, for example, peer punishment. So you allow people to uh, punish one another if they don't contribute. And this gets you to a certain, you know, it gets you so far. Uh, but eventually you run into the problem of second order free riding. In social sciences, the free rider problem occurs when a person, the free rider, puts strain on the system by not paying for the resources, public goods or services that he or she is benefiting from. While punishment can lead people to cooperate more, in this case pay their fair share, it costs to put effective systems in place. What to do when the leader decides to let the offender off instead? One option is to punish them for opting not to punish the offenders, but this can create what is called a second order free rider problem, 
And who wants to pay the cost of telling off people who don't tell people off? So this alone isn't enough to scale up cooperation. Back to Michael. If it's costly to punish somebody, then you want someone else to do it. One very successful way to, to, get, uh, to get cooperation off the ground is to set up an institution. You just select one person and say, you're going to be the leader, um, and you can extract taxes from everybody else and use those taxes to punish whomever you want. And what previous work has shown is that the stronger you make that leader, so the, the more uh, powerful you make that leader in terms of uh, the multiplier on those taxes, the larger a group you can sustain and the more contributions you can sustain. To understand how different types of cooperation might impact on people's behaviour, Michael introduced the idea that, in addition to deciding what to contribute to the central pot and what to keep for themselves, players could also offer some of their money to the game's leader. We didn't, of course, introduce anything like bribery. We didn't say anything like that, but that's effectively what it was. And the leader, in turn, could do their usual thing of you know, punishing or not punishing, or they could accept that, accept that little contribution. And then what we found was the opposite result. So the stronger you make the leader, the weaker the public good contributions. So what they end up using that power for is to extract more money for themselves. Because if you do the math, even without doing the math, if you just think about it for a second, the amount of money that they can make by extracting just a little bit from every player is much larger than the amount of money that they could make by making the country or the public good work more effectively. So we've introduced bribery into it and it undermines everything. Transparency is often hailed as an important tool to tackle corruption. Michael found, however, that under some conditions, transparency actually increased the rates of bribery. I asked him why he thought that was. What we wanted to show is that a lot of the kind of um, intuitive anti-corruption strategies that, that people do apply in the world, it comes from a place, from, a, from what we call weird psychology, Western educated, industrialized, rich democratic psychology, which is very different to the rest of the world. It relies on things like norms uh, uh, that, that say that actually this kind of behavior that this person is engaging in is bad and you shouldn't be doing it. Not a world in which actually the problem is not that you know the Prime Minister gave his brother a contract, it's that anyone or oh, most people in this society would do the same thing in those circumstances because you're supposed to be there for your family, you're supposed to be there for your friends. Okay, so what we did was we introduced transparency into the game. We introduced full transparency so that everything is anonymous but still visible. And what we found was that, yeah, that actually did work uh, among, so we ran this study among Canadians, and we found that if the multiplier in the public good was sufficiently large, or the leader had sufficient power to be punishing others, then actually that transparency worked in the Canadian context. If we played this in Cameroon, we might have gotten a different answer uh, because the baseline for that corruption might have been, uh, might have been higher. And so in the condition in which the multiplier in the public good was low and the ability of the leader to, to punish you know, free riders was weak, then actually transparency did the opposite. It increased the amount of bribery that was taking place and reduced the amount of contributions. And you say, well, why would, why would transparency do that? Um, the reason is that it solved a different uh, problem. In that world in which the economic potential, this multiply wasn't high enough, and the leaders just don't have the power to be, you know, to be, to be fighting all corruption, if you, uh, if you like, um, then actually the correct move is to engage in bribery in our game, and perhaps the correct move is to help your family, is to help your friends, right? The puzzle in terms of bribery is not, should I be engaging in bribery? It's, how much do I pay? So transparency solved a different puzzle. It revealed that everybody was engaging in bribery and it told you the price of the bribe. And so it made bribery more efficient. And so these intuitions don't always take us to the right place. And that's why I think you know, these kinds of theoretical frameworks are, are very useful for addressing these, these problems. As Michael's findings show, decisions over the right course of action can be impacted by our environment. One difficulty in tackling the issue is that behavior that might appear unethical or even be illegal in one country could appear simply pragmatic to those living in another. I asked Michael what role culture plays in the way we view the issue. What is corruption? Um, and honestly, I, I, what is the difference between lobbying and bribery? Uh, one's institutionalized and legal, but they're, they're very close to the same thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm less interested in, you know, in, in, in labeling something, except insofar as it's helpful to, to fight it, if you like. Um, but I am interested in its effects. And so, what I suspect is the case is that the absolute amount, the cost of corruption, that absolute cost, is higher in a Western society. And that's simply because the Western society is wealthier. But the relative cost is higher in, in those poorer countries. And so it's felt more acutely. So to quote you know, from the paper, um, the difference in a Western country might be the difference between uh, 40 hospitals 
and 30 hospitals. That's, that's the difference of 10, right? But in a poor country, it might be the difference between three hospitals and no hospitals, or three hospitals and one hospital. A smaller absolute difference, right? Like two or three versus 10, but relative terms, a, a massive difference. So yeah, I do think that there are massive inefficiencies uh, due to the corruption in our own, in our own nations, um, but we just don't feel them. Life is pretty good, actually. We're, mo you know, we're, we're all doing, doing pretty well. Sandra Sequeira, an assistant professor in development economics at LSE, also stresses that corruption isn't just a developing world issue. We tend to think about the developing world as yeah. just culturally being more open to corruption. This is how things are done and it's a bit inevitable. Um, that's not something that I have found in my research in particular. I mean, when I first approached this, I was thinking that corruption can exist anywhere. And um, more often than not, when I talked about corruption in Africa, I would be told, you know, you don't have to go that far. You can find corruption in certain ports in the US and certain ports in Europe. So, so I think it's quite pervasive at all levels. Um, there's going to be a lot of heterogeneity and differences across uh, sectors depending again on institutional capability, the ability for a state to monitor bureaucrats, the incentives that can be given to bureaucrats, the technology available to try to detect um, corruption and document corruption so that you can act on it. And, and so naturally developing countries are usually uh, going to have a harder time because they sometimes don't have the technology and they don't have the state capacity to be able to monitor, to reward um, honest bureaucrats and to punish um, dishonest or corrupt bureaucrats. Um, but again, I don't think it's a problem that's confined to the developing world at all. And that's what we're finding, as you were saying, that uh, it can be more pervasive than that. Sandra's research into corruption has taken her to Africa. Her work has examined the impact that corruption can have on the decision making of organizations or firms. Sandra focused on the operations of two ports, Durban in South Africa and the more corrupt port of Maputo in Mozambique. I asked her what her findings revealed. So the South African ports had a system where if you wanted to ship anything through the border and through the port, um, you would have to submit the documentation online. So you wouldn't be interacting face to face with a customs agent. Whereas in Maputo, at the time of the study, that was not the case. And so the moment you have to interact face to face, there's a lot of uh, conversations and a lot of collusion going on um, so that you can pay bribes. So we found that because corruption was much higher and much more uncertain in one of the ports, so in the port in Mozambique, that there was um, a large amount of firms in South Africa who were going the long way around uh, in order to ship through a less corrupt port. Um, so I think what f firms' understanding was that there was a lot of uncertainty. They never knew when they would have to pay a bribe, and that created all sorts of complications in um, in the transport system because they would have to give some extra pocket money to the intermediaries who are moving goods across borders and across the port without knowing if that money was going to be used to pay a bribe or not. And, and that type of uncertainty um, just created this narrative that you have to grease too many hands to go through the Maputo port, therefore we're going to risk conject uh, congestion, longer travel, um, and higher transportation costs just in order to ship through a less corrupt port. So, so I think that the main takeaway is that corruption can distort people's decisions. The alternative um, story would be that um, corruption is just a tax that you pay, but it doesn't really change your decisions. You just have to pay a bit more to get things done, but it doesn't change ultimately the way you behave. And here I could show that firms actually did change massively their behavior just because of corruption. Your findings were used to basically improve the anti-corruption policy policies in Mozambique. So what um, changes did they make to try and reduce the problem? What happened was that they introduced a technology that already existed in South Africa in the port of Mozambique. Sandra is referring here to the implementation of a system called the electronic single window. This was introduced in Mozambique after she provided evidence that Maputo's competitor, the port of Durban, had reduced their instances of corruption by using an online system to submit clearance documentation. And, um, and the general understanding is that that reduced corruption significantly. Um, I went back about six months later and, and the data did suggest that there were far fewer bribes being paid.
Um, so I think an interesting takeaway of this study is that, you know, sometimes we often think about corruption as being part of people's culture, uh, that is something very slow moving, that is very hard to change, when in fact, when you have the right um, context and the right institutional setting, you can actually change things. So in this case, it was a change in technology. Um, it was a change in, in context as well, because as the country introduced other forms of taxation, such as value-added tax, that is more profitable for the government to get revenues, there was less interest in getting uh, revenues from, uh, from tariffs. Tariffs were also going down at the time, and so these corruption costs at the port became far less important for customs. And, and so I think it's a combination of people's incentives and uh, the technology that reduced corruption. Of course, change can be difficult wherever it is made, but one imagines especially so when someone benefiting from the current system will lose out as a result. I asked Sandra how the changes to operations in Mozambique have been received and how you change the behavior of those benefiting from current operations. Right, Th that is a very big challenge. Um, I think in, in this case, we were helped by a, a lot of factors. So one, as I said, the corruption or the bribes were being paid mostly to evade tariffs. Um, at the time of the study, tariffs were coming down significantly because the country had signed a trade agreement with regional partners, and, and so tariffs were coming down to zero. So that was already uh, reducing the ability for bureaucrats to extract, um, to extract bribes from, from agents and from firms. Um, so I think that changed their incentives and also the fact that there were uh, international institutions, so the World Bank and the F IMF, who were putting pressure for uh, trade costs to be reduced uh, in the region. And so there was a general awareness at the government level that this type of petty corruption had to be cleaned up. Um, so I suppose that's what you need, is you need uh, incentives at a higher level to clean this up and also changing people's choice sets at the local, at the more micro level so that bureaucrats have less of an incentive to extract bribes. Creating the right conditions to reduce extortion when one party is benefiting is difficult. But what about when both parties gain something from the transaction? Jonathan Wagel has been studying bribery at roadway tolls in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. In order to understand the incentives of those paying bribes, motorcycle taxi drivers were offered their money back if they were to pay the toll booth tax instead of the more usual bribe. I asked him what this experiment revealed. So we wanted to understand the citizen side of corruption. There's been a lot more research on what I would say is sort of the government side of corruption. Top-down audits, you know, inst uh, policies like that. We were interested in understanding whether you could intervene on the citizen side and whether that might be a way, you know, a, a potential policy tool to reduce corruption. And then before long we realized, well, we need to understand why citizens pay bribes in the first place. So what are the different potential motivations that an, an average citizen might have in, in paying a, a government bureaucrat? And so I think there's a few that come to mind. One is, well, they don't have a choice. This, they're just being shaken down. Uh, so it's, this is sort of outright extortion. So we're not going to look at that because that's, that's not really the, the question we're interested in. We're interested in, in situations where the citizen does have some discretion and is actually choosing to pay a bribe instead of paying, for example, the full tax or the full price for a service. So the other options, I think, are, well, this lowers the financial cost of whatever service they were trying to, um, to get or it could also lower the time cost, it could speed things up, or finally it could be some kind of psychic cost story where um, an absence of what we call tax morale uh, is, is present and that means I don't, I, don't, I don't pay any kind of psychic cost for, uh, for paying a bribe. So we wanted to find a setting where we could study the, diff the importance of these different factors. And uh, the DRC is one of the sort of most um, thought to be the most corrupt countries in the world, according to cross-country data on perceptions of corruption. So we thought that would be an interesting place to look at this. And we wanted to find a setting where citizens are paying frequent bribes. Uh, so the, the norm is to pay bribes because then we could look at, okay, what happens when you try to change their incentives a little bit? 
And we worked with a population of motorcycle taxi drivers who are passing through the city's tolls sometimes multiple times per day, but at least a couple times per week. And each time they go through the toll, they have a chance to bribe the toll collector or to pay the, the full tax. If they pay the full tax, they get a receipt. And we know that all the money that gets a receipt does in fact make it to the government. We, we sort of track that. So then the question was, what can we incentivize drivers to bring us receipts more often, showing that they're actually shifting from paying bribes into paying the full toll tax. Before the experiment, only about 12% of people were paying the full tax, okay? So you know, almost 90% of the drivers were paying bribes. So they said there's a lot of room to potentially um, change behavior here. And so what we, what we wanted to do is, is then provide some kind of incentive. So we provided both financial incentives and what we called social incentives. For the, I'll just focus on the financial incentives because I think it's, it's sort of the most clear. We offer to fully reimburse you if you bring us a receipt proving that you pay the tax and not a bribe, or we will offer you a 50% uh, reimbursement. Jonathan estimates that around 30% of motorcycle drivers in his study were incentivized to pay the tax instead of the bribe as a result. And that's, again, pretty large. But I think the question always remains, how come the remaining 70% you know, are, are, are paying bribes instead, even when we're fully reimbursing their, their, the cost of their toll. That's kind of the puzzle that emerges from this. And this is true of a lot of corruption papers. You know, even if you see, or corruption studies, I should say, just in general, even if you see a, a pretty large response, often the level of, of behavior, of, of sort of bribery in our case, or other types of corruption, still stays relatively high. And so I think this suggests that the, the pure kind of financial cost motivation is not the only one. We need to think about other aspects of why citizens are supplying bribes in this case. I asked Jonathan if part of their reluctance to change was because the payment was viewed as just a normal part of doing business. Yeah, so that the, is, is it just something everyone does is kind of the psychic cost piece of this. So if you're in some kind of an equilibrium where bribe payment's common, no one's getting punished, then why would anyone feel any kind of sense of guilt or shame if they pay a bribe, right? So that's kind of the low equilibrium. And then the question is always, how do you shift to a, a different world, a different equilibrium, where now you have low rates of corruption, high psychic costs, you actually do feel shame when you pay a bribe or you participate in some way in a corrupt transaction, and then actually high detection and punishment probabilities. So that's always the key question as we're kind of thinking about, you know, um, how, to, how to move from the one equilibrium to the other. In our setting, we think the most likely explanation for the remaining 70% of people who are not choosing to respond to this sort of offer of fully reimbursing their toll cost, we think it has to do with the time cost element. So that was one of the other reasons why a citizen might choose to pay a bribe because it facilitates, it speeds up whatever kind of service or transaction they're engaging in. So the bureaucracy sort of side is quite heavy. Exactly, exactly. Whenever there's, whenever there's um, some kind of a process that is slow or involves a hassle, then that's a common uh, instance where you see incentives to pay bribes and to be corrupt. So it just in our, in our specific situation, what we found when we did a little um, sort of qualitative field work in addition to our, our randomized experiment, which I was describing previously, was that these uh, toll officers, they, they have this machine which they use to issue the receipts, but they don't keep it on them up at the toll. You have to basically walk down to this little hut, uh, you know, maybe 20 meters off the road, um, and you have to sit down and they sort of, you know, go through and type up the receipt, but then they also copy everything down in, the, in this big ledger, which seems on the face of it pretty unnecessary. So in other words, they exaggerate the time cost in order, I think, to disincentivize the number of drivers who are going to ask for these things. Because it just makes, it just means you have to sit there for, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes. So um, they actually want to continue with the, the Exactly. Situation. So this is, this is kind of a, a response of the agents to the system that the government pot tried to put in there to reduce their discretion, to actually increase the amount of money that's making it to the government. But then, you know, humans are humans, you're going to respond to your incentives. And, and you know, the fact is, 
a lot of these officers, um, you know, what they lived, the money they lived on was coming from these sort of side payments, these bribes. So they, they, they then responded by making the, the overall time cost of this higher on the drivers. Um, and so if you just look at actually what the amount of time that drivers report spending at the toll, it increases by 70% um, if you ask for a receipt. That's actually really costly, especially if you're a motor taxi driver where you maybe have a, pa a passenger who's waiting for you getting kind of frustrated and you're, you can see your tip going down, right? <laughs> or there's another, there's another customer who you're just not going to reach because it took a, that additional 12 minutes is sort of money wasted. It seems clear that policymakers will need to understand both the reasons for demanding a bribe and giving one if they are to create the right conditions for change. I asked Sandra Sequeira if we needed to be far more targeted in trying to reduce corruption. An important point to take away from these studies is that corruption is very, very context specific. So it really depends on you being able to identify who are the beneficiaries, um, how is corruption actually happen, what type of interactions between agents are happening, um, trying to document it, understand the magnitude of corruption as well, and understand if how different anti-corruption strategies may play out in practice. So which ones are going to work best, which ones may backfire and make matters worse. Um, so there's going to be tremendous differences between the type of petty corruption that I observed in the ports and perhaps corruption that you may find in health uh, clinics or that you may find in schools or that you may find at a higher level in government. So this requires just a lot more research to understand the fundamentals of each um, corruption problem in different contexts. So, is corruption inevitable? Well, I suppose my thinking about this is that not necessarily that it's inevitable, but that it's important to document it as best we can. Um, and then think about the trade-offs. So again, once you're able to understand the dynamics of corruption and understand the magnitude of its effects on society, so the economic and social or political costs of corruption, um, then the conversation becomes a bit easier as to thinking what are the type of anti-corruption strategies that we can try to design to fight this, how costly are those going to be, what is the likelihood of success of these anti-corruption strategies. And then you make decisions as to whether it's worth implementing them or what is the minimum level of corruption that um, you know, kind of uh, the costs do not outweigh uh, the cost of the anti-corruption strategy. So, so again, I, I would think much more about documenting it, understanding the real costs of corruption, the, the most obvious ones, but also the unintended ones, and, and then think about the costs associated with anti-corruption policies and just do that calculus and think about the trade-offs associated with them. And I do think that there's something, something to be said about habit formation and social norms, is that it may be the norm that everyone pays a bribe and therefore you're going to pay a bribe too. But those norms can shift. And again, depending on the context, on the use of technology, changing people's incentives, people might respond. Um, and so I, I suppose to end on a positive note is that if we devote enough energy and resources to try to understand the context, then we may be able to fix what um, we would otherwise think is unfixable. Jonathan Wagel. I think it is in some way it is inevitable because of these hard hardwired desires to better your lot and to favor your kin and this process of this back and forth between the creation of institutions to put constraints on behavior and those fundamental human tendencies. There's always going to be a bit of a, a back and forth. I think all of the societies that have been very successful in expanding both the prosperity, the kind of economic well-being, but also the, the uh, political freedoms and liberty of their people have managed to construct states that have capacity, that, may, that limit uh, corruption. That, I think that's, that's almost, almost universally true among the very rich countries today. And so the question is, is that just sort of a luxury good or is that actually part of the development process? My view is that state capacity is really important for development and that actually as policymakers and in thinking about some of the challenges that um, poorer countries face today, that, that understanding how to uh, 
to, to build more effective states that have less corruption and have better incentives for bureaucrats so that um, you have less opportunities for, um, for bribe taking and for other forms of corruption. I do view that as a, as a really important goal and part of the process of, of development more generally. Finally, Michael Muthukrishna. It's hard to say whether corruption is inevitable, but I would say that uh, the trend toward corruption is always there. There is always a force pulling us toward corruption. I think, uh, which we are trying to suppress, you can call it corruption, we're trying to suppress lower order scales of cooperation so that we can work together at a higher scale. And that is becoming increasingly important because the kinds of problems that we face are at a higher scale. If we want to coordinate on things uh, like corruption itself, but also on things like climate change or, or the protection of our borders or, or whatever, uh, that requires us to cooperate at a, at, a, at a higher scale. And so these lower order coalitional things, they, they make things more inefficient, but they also lead to goals and outcomes that are good for those smaller groups the elite or uh, tribes or, or whatever, at the expense of what is what would be better for all of us, at the expense of everybody contributing to that public good, uh, you know, ma maximally. So, so yeah, I mean, it, you in an ideal world, you're trying to stamp this this stuff out, but you do want to kind of suppress it as 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 much as is possible. Tell us what you think using the hashtag LSEIQ. I produced this episode of LSEIQ with Ollie Johnson, James Ratti, and Anna Bevan. Want to explore more about corruption? This episode was based in part on the following research. Corruption, Cooperation and the Evolution of Pro-Social Institutions by Michael Muthukrishna. Corrupting Cooperation and How Anti-Corruption Strategies May Backfire by Michael Muthukrishna, Patrick Francois, Cheyenne Purumadi and Joseph Henrich. An Empirical Study of Corruption in Ports by Sandra Sikera and Simeon Jankov and The Supply of Bribes, Evidence from Roadway Tolls in the Democratic Republic of the Congo by Otis Reed and Jonathan Wagle. Join us next time when we ask, are we doomed or can the climate crisis be averted? For more episodes of this podcast and to subscribe, please visit lse.ac.uk forward slash IQ or search for LSE IQ in your favourite podcast app. And please consider leaving us a review as this makes the podcast easier for new listeners to discover.